It is May 17th at 5.02 p.m. Welcome to the San Marino Unified School District Board of Education special meeting. Board President Shelley Ryan. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, it is my pleasure to invite you. I just want to go through some housekeeping things. Uh, we are uh, meeting in person at Huntington Middle School. It is approximately 5.03. In-person attendees must pre-register. You can also join virtually via Zoom. All meetings of the Board of Education are open to members of the public unless publicly noticed as a confidential closed session as allowed by the law, Education Code 35147. Members of the public may address the board as outlined in the public comment section of the agenda. The audio of all meetings is recorded a member of the public may be held liable for any slanderous or otherwise defamatory statements. In consideration of the board, members of the audience, please turn off or silence your cell phones while in the meeting. The San Marino Unified School District encourages those with disabilities to participate fully in the public meeting process. If you need a disability related modification or accommodation, including auxiliary aids or services to participate in the public meeting, contact the assistant to the, super, to the superintendent at jdelatore at smusd.us or 626-299-7000, extension 1310, at least 48 hours before the scheduled board meeting so that we may make every reasonable effort to accommodate you under government code 54953.2, Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, um, section 202.42 USC 12.132. Documents provided to a majority of the Board of Education regarding an open session item on this agenda is available for public inspection here and at the district office located at 1665 West Drive. San Marino during normal hour business hours. In addition, such writings documents may be viewed on the district's website at www.smusd.us. I'd like to open our session now. And so I'd like everyone to stand, join me during the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Choi, would you like to lead? Right hand over your heart, let's begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for joining me on the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, approval of the agenda, this is an action item. May I have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Chong. Thank you, Mr. Chang. And now we move, oh, we have to do roll call. Mr. Chang, please. <laughs> Mrs. Chen? Aye. Mrs. Chong? Aye. Mrs. Ryan? Aye. And our student board member is not able to join us. She's got AP finals, <laughs> so. We're thinking about you, Vahini. All right, next, public comment. This is information item. The Board of Education has adopted board policy 9323B. This is to ensure the public's right to be heard in any matters pertaining to the San Marino Unified School District. Persons who wish to provide public comment will have three options to submit public comment. First, you may submit through an online form. Second, request to speak during the meeting through question and answer and phone dial-in. Third, you may request to speak during the meeting in person through the public comment card. Submit through an online form. The public may submit public comments for the open or closed session. And this was done on May 17th from 11 through 3.30 p.m. Comments received during this time will not be read during the meeting but will be provided to the Board of Education. Please submit any comments through this way at http 
slash slash bit l y slash s b o e s five one seven two one. The request to speak during the meeting through question and answer and phone dial in may be done during public comment. The meeting will pause for one minute to take requests to speak. Raise your hand function is used to take requests during the public comment period. For online attendees, press the raise hand icon, add yourself to the queue. For phone attendees, dial star nine. The speaking order will be determined based on the order of requests received. Individual speakers will be unmuted and then called upon to speak. There will also be a request to speak during the meeting in person via the public comment card. Please complete the public comment card and submit the completed card to the designated drop off drop box with the assistant to the superintendent no later than when the agenda section or item on the agenda is called by the board president. There will be opportunities for the public comment and they're offered at the start of the open session for matters that are on the agenda. The Board of Education reserves the right to add a public comment period to any individual item on the agenda. Five minutes may be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 20 minutes to each subject matter. However, in the event there are more than four speakers on the same subject matter, the Board President retains the discretion to adjust limit the time allotment to each speaker to ensure that all wishing to speak will be heard within the 20 minute allotment. This is now 5A communications from the audience regarding matters on the agenda and they are to be made at this time. Thank you, President Ryan. We are now pausing for one minute to take requests for public comments for matters on the agenda. If you would like to make a request to speak regarding matters on the agenda, please press the raise hand icon dial star nine if you're joining us by phone or submit a public comment card if you're joining us in person. We have 30 seconds remaining. If you would like to submit a request to speak, please press the raise hand icon, dial star nine or submit a public comment card. President Ryan, we have no requests. Thank you, Dr. Choi. So next, number six, item six is the process for filing the gover governing board member vacancy. This is ed code 5090, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Allison Deegan from LA LACO. Um, this is a discussion item. The board will discuss the process and timeline, timeline for filing the vacancy following the resignation of board Vice President Corey Barbary, which was filed on May 11, 2021. Thank you, President Ryan, Board of Education. Uh, tonight uh, should be a fairly simple process. We're here tonight for staff to receive direction from the Board of Education with regards to the steps ahead of us as we seek to fill the vacancy created last uh, board meeting. So Allison Deegan is, should be on the line here. And Steve, do we have her? Yes, Dr. Um, Deegan is now on our Zoom. Hello, Dr. Deegan. How are you? Great, can you hear us clearly? Yes. Great. So Dr. Deegan, uh, we were put in contact with her. She has assisted other districts who have gone uh, through this exact thing and has a lot of experience, a lot of wisdom to help us with this uh, along the way here. So we talked last time about a, a number of steps that were given to us by our own council, which aligned very well with what Dr. Deegan uh, talked us through uh, the next day as well. So um, Dr. Deegan, can I turn this over to you at this point? Each of the board members in your packet you have a letter from LA County Office of Education which outlines those steps. Also, I want you to know we have Elise Nichols from Lozano Smith on the line. 
who is a colleague of Ryan Tung, who is working with us on this as well, in case we need our counsel. So this, in this letter that D Dr. Deegan provided us, it gives sort of the outline of the steps necessary and the ed code relevant to this matter. And then you have a blank worksheet, uh, somewhat blank. It just memorializes what happened on the 11th uh, with regards to the announcement and the res resignation. And then uh, we'll be asking you for some direction later on with regards to the other steps. And then I've given you three different applications that Dr. Choi was able to find for us to compare with regards to applications for provisional appointments to the board. And then I did create a Google form of our own just as a starting point. Uh, so we'll be looking to that a little bit later. But Dr. Deegan, uh, would you be able to at this point uh, do a short presentation with the board and then field some questions? Yes, and uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson. Good, good evening, everyone. And I will say just before the meeting started, I sent you two additional documents, Dr. Wilson. One is just a collection of the relevant ed codes. So the board has them in one place and they can look at them for reference. Right. And the other was a bulletin that LACO distributes periodically about the process for filling a governing board vacancy. So it has more detail than our vacancy letter that we recently sent you provides. And the last time we issued it was in 2019. So you, you the board members can, can review that um, and, and have, a, have a, a short primer of the process all in one place, because our vacancy letter isn't, isn't as detailed as that. Right. Um, so I will say you have, uh, uh, because you're, the date in which your letter was, uh, the letter resignation was submitted and then conveyed to the county superintendent, the key point when the vacancy is operative is, uh, unless the individual has passed away or is removed from office or whatever, if they just submit their resignation, it's when the county superintendent is notified. Um, of the vacancy. So I believe the, the date in the letter by which the board has to either call a special election or fill the vacancy by, by uh, a provisional appointment is July 11th. I don't have the letter in front of me. So you can, you can just look at that date. It's 60 days after the date that the vacancy is operative. So if the board chooses to not fill the vacancy, it will go to a special election. Let me cover that scenario first because it's, it's actually more simple in process. What the Ed Code says is it must be held at the next regularly scheduled election, not your board's election, but really the next available election date. And in Los Angeles County, currently the next election date is the November election. So if you choose to hold a special election, you'll have that election in, in um, November. So you'll have a vacancy until November. Um, there, there sometimes are unique election dates. This year we have a unique election date happening on July 20th because of, um, I think it's an assembly member vacancy. So they call that election date, which must be held on that date. Once that date is established, other jurisdictions that want to hold an election can jump on that unique election date. But in this case, being it that it's already May, I don't see an opportunity to have a, a, a special election sooner then November, given the, the lead time that the registrar recorder needs, the candidate filing and all of that. So just get, get in your mind that if you choose not to appoint um, within 60 days, it will go to a special election, either by your choice as a board, or if you fail to take action to appoint, the county superintendent of schools will order this special election and that'll be held in November. That person will run for, uh, I, I believe this is the, the second two years of the term, is that correct? The office is up in, in 2022. Uh, there's another year and yeah. four so five yeah. months. So, yeah. So they'll be in office till the end of that term in, in, in uh, uh, November of 2022. And then a new election will be called for a full four-year term. So that's how that will play out. So just be mindful as that 60 days ticks down and you deliberate and you figure out what you're going to do. I would encourage you to make that decision, vacancy appointment or special election sooner rather than later so that both the registrar has time to process the election and add it to the November cycle and the community becomes aware, or if you're going to appoint, your appointment process includes some room to get the process done that you're not doing it on the, on the 60th day, the last day, so you have that lead time. So let me, let me uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about the, the vacancy appointment in, in uh, the document that I hope you'll all uh, get a copy of and you can use for your reference. We follow what the Ed Code says. And it, it, essentially, if we boil down what the Ed Code says, you have to make a notice of the vacancy um, to the community. 
Um, but really it only says that then you have to announce who you appointed. It's sort of a little bit of an abbreviated instruction. Yeah, let's go to the second document, the PDF. And that would be the, um, yeah, if we can do that. Sorry, I apologize for not getting these to you sooner. Yeah. So if we, if we scroll down the steps to make a vacancy appointment, it talks about announcing it to the community. However, LACO um, recommends additional steps to be taken so that the community is not only fully noticed, but fully engaged. And the emphasis here is on transparency, on community engagement, on consistency of process, fairness of process, and recognizing that all parts of this process, all 360 of it, is a public process. Any documents produced, even scratch paper where you're ranking a candidate or something as you interview them, they're all public documents. And we've had the district attorney request the scrap paper that the board used, you know, the, the rating sheets that the, that the subcommittee used to qualify candidates to move forward. So anything you do in the process is, is a public document, is a public process, is open, held in open session. So just keep that in mind and there won't be any, any challenges if you, if you recognize the transparency. And I'm sure that's the goal of the district as well. So what we recommend in this process is that you do have an application it can be very simple, it can be very basic, it can be born of the, the, the culture and the needs of your, your specific district or community. It can be generic. Typically they involve some question about either what is your past involvement with the schools or why are you interested in being involved with the schools? Because we all know that many, many uh, highly qualified and deeply, deeply committed board members don't have prior experience with the schools that's not a that's not a requirement but you're just trying to get to know the person why are you here why are you applying what what goals do you have when you serve so you can determine the questions that you ask just be sure that everyone is asked the same questions another point of transparency and consistency that's really key is set a firm deadline for the return of the applications you may want to have a have an option to return a hard copy in person. Some members of our community appreciate and need that option, especially during the pandemic, where they may not have uh, uh, reliable online access, they may not have high-speed internet or whatever, and they're more comfortable submitting a hard copy. If I were setting up this, um, this process, I would say um, that that option is there, that they can bring it down to the district as well as submit it online, if you choose to, it's up to you but that's just another measure of inclusiveness. But what you must do in my advice is have a firm deadline. If it's five o'clock on Friday of this date and somebody turns it in or emails it to you 501 and says, oh, well, my printer was slow or whatever, you have to be firm about that because that's a transparency issue. That's a fairness issue. And you know, if they submit an application that isn't complete, that doesn't have what you asked for, if you ask for a CV, or if you ask for contact info, a physical address, so you can check whether they're a resident of the district or a voter, registered voter. If they don't give you the basic information that you need, you should disqualify that application. So everything, it's applied the same way to every applicant, the deadline, the components of the, of the application that you ask them to answer, the other things you may ask them to, to provide, like a CV or like, um, um, their 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 street address, you know, their home address, so that the residency can be verified. Sometimes people get their mail at a PO box, or they get their mail at their job, or whatever, and they're reluctant to provide their home address. But you need to you need to encourage them that their confidentiality will be will be preserved and their home address will not be announced. But that you need it to qualify the application and move it forward. And as long as you apply the same standards to everyone, uh, you should be okay. The other thing that we recommend is that there is an interview process. It doesn't have to be an hour long. Interviews can be as short as five minutes. You can have them one after another. You can set them up on different days if you choose, but just make sure that the public has a chance to attend a meeting, that it's not such a special meeting. Say, if you typically have your meetings at five or six at night, that this is a 10 a.m. weekday meeting, that precludes the public from attending. And there can be complaints about that. So make sure that the meeting in which you're, you're interviewing candidates, presenting them to the public and presenting them to the board to potentially vote on, that it's an accessible meeting, including in terms of scheduling, so that it's the kind of time frame that the community is used to and not some wholly un, 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 unknown time that makes it difficult for people to attend or even hear about. The other thing that we recommend in, in, uh, you know, in terms of the transparency and then standardization is how you promote that the vacancy is there. 
the code requires you to post a notice that the vacancy is here or there. You, you, we've, we've all seen those little teeny public notices in the newspaper or even in an online newspaper, they're very small. They tend not to stir up candidates and stir up interest. So what we recommend is that if you can generate a news story about the vacancy, and it could even be about the outgoing board member and the service they provided, but get interest in the district. And what I recommend personally is that you go beyond the school's world, go to the city, go to the chamber of commerce, go to the community college and get notices as far and wide as you can. And that can generate candidates who normally aren't, aren't uh, deeply focused on the schools. They may not have kids in school. They may not get the notices. They may not have heard about the vacancy because they didn't attend the last few board meetings. So anything you can do to promote uh, 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 spreading out of, of the word that the vacancy exists is going to be good for your district. Even if it generates a lot of candidates, sometimes a lot of candidates are difficult to manage, but it's a good thing when you have a, a really broad interest in the community. I apologize, there's an ice cream truck going by. You may have to listen to that song. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's the kind of thing that we recommend. And then in the interview, everyone is asked exactly the same questions. Similar to the way you may have seen done at a personnel commission event. You don't go off script. You don't ask follow-ups of one person, but then not another. Ask everyone the same questions and make it clear to candidates that that's what's happening. Because sometimes you, you, you worry if you're feel, falling flat, if nobody is responding or no, and they just go on to the next question. But that's, again, a, 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 an important point of transparency and consistency. You ask everyone the same questions, and then you're able to compare and contrast. Now, the challenges of this very open process is board members will have to Perhaps they have friends in the applicant pool and you'll have to tell them in open session or you know, by not voting for them or not voting for them as a finalist or whatever, that that's what's going on. There's no voting in, in, in close session. So everyone will see your vote and who you're supporting. Sometimes boards have challenges when they have a, a slew of candidates. Uh, you know, there are four board members and four, four, five candidates, eight candidates. Each, each candidate only gets one vote. So they have to keep discussing why they're they're vying for this candidate or that candidate again it's on the record so it's transparent and in that way the board members are articulating the criteria that are important to them and they should be grounded around the criteria that you've articulated in your application um, you shouldn't have a have a thumbs up thumbs down and that's the way you're voting i mean as an individual you certainly can do that but in the interest of transparency you're going to be asked to explain why you're voting thumbs up thumbs down if you can't agree on a candidate because my guess is what I've seen over the years, I've been doing this 20 years, managing all the school elections in Los Angeles County, by and large, we have breathtaking qualifications coming forward. It's very rare that there's nobody or more than a few people in a pool that wouldn't all be fine candidates. So you get into parsing who's better than that and sort of, I wouldn't call it ranking, but, but articulating your preference. And you just have to be willing to do that. That's part of what we sign up for when we, when we run for office on a board. So that may be at the end, if you have a lot of fabulous candidates, you'll have to come to an agreement. And um, at least three of you will have to select uh, one candidate as their choice. Now, after a candidate is selected, you can move very quickly. You can swear in and seat that candidate at the same meeting if you've already qualified that they live in the district that they're you know that they're um registered to vote and then uh the other qualifications that you've articulated if they're there uh, you could seat them and uh, swear them in and seat them at a later meeting and have something be more ceremonial just focused on them and then move into the regular agenda you could have a critical a critical um decision point coming up like your budget where you really need a full complement of the board. So that would be the, a, 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 a provocation to schedule very carefully so that this could get done. And the other thing I do recommend is without rushing, without feeling like you're rushed, taking the time that you need as a board and as a community, that you leave time at the end, there is a remote chance that you'll go through this whole process and you won't have a candidate come forward that either is qualified or that the board would choose to select. If not, you can still go back out. If you have some time on your 60 day um, appointment window, you can go and seek additional candidates and add to the process and, and, and view more candidates. So that's an option that you have, but that, that option goes away if you get to the 60th day, then the county soup will call the special election. So you lose your, your ability to choose as a board if you run through the whole 60 days. So that those are sort of the bare bones and 
we 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 provided. I, I'm glad that Dr. Choi found some other samples. We were we were reaching out to districts to try to get a few, and we'll see if we can get more of the application. But I wouldn't belabor that too long because your clock is ticking now. Your clock is already running of that 60 day period. Um, this is a very unusual time to be doing like this because of COVID, because of the the distance of the community. I don't know what your electronic board member ten, attendance has been like or what you now that you start up in person, what that attendance will be, hopefully it'll pick up. Unfortunately, it's gonna intersect with summer when we all know we always have low attendance in summer unless a special hot button issue is, is, has been promoted. But you're, you're also moving into a time where um, unfortunately community interest may wane and we, we would love to capture that community interest now before school is out. And while people are suddenly interested in attending in person, if they have that option, or participating online, I'm sure like everyone, I, I can just see from this meeting, you perfected the online online um, a forum and the Zoom forum. So hopefully the community is, is well-trained in how to participate through that way, because none of this is, it can, it can work if the community doesn't participate, but not, not as well as we'd like it to, right? You want, you want to come as close as you can to emulating community interest in an election. I know it can't be as high as, thousands of people turning out to vote, but you want to be sure that the community had their chance, that a good complement of candidates stepped forward, that the board considered them carefully and, and vetted them in a consistent and transparent process, and then is comfortable to make a decision. This will be, you know, your, 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 your colleague until November, uh, at a minimum, until November uh, 2022. And then if they would choose to run again, they'd be your colleague for longer. But it's so it's important. And a board member appointed in this way has uh, has the full powers of a, of a board member. It's not a, a, a diminished position in any way. I'll, I'll take your questions in one second. I just want to bring up two other um, possibilities under the law, under the Ed Code. Say you went through this whole process. You did a fine job. You found a great candidate. You appointed them. They accepted, you swore them in and you seated them on the board. Within 30 days of that seating of that person on the board, the community is able to start gathering a petition to unseat the appointment. And the result of that, if they get enough signatures and the signatures are valid, we validate them through the registrar recorder, the appointment is immediately vetted, I mean, I'm sorry, immediately vacated, so canceled. You now have a vacancy again on the board and it forces that special election in November. So that's a danger. I've only seen it happen twice in the 20 years I've been here. Unfortunately, one was about a month ago in, in a local district where an appointment was made. A group in the community didn't agree with the appointment. So they gathered enough signatures. They were valid. And the appointment was immediately canceled. And now it forced a special election. The person who was unseated from the appointment is now running in the special election. So it's a little bit, a little bit crazy there. But that that reality is out there. It's like I said, it's very unusual, but it's something the community can do. And the thought, I don't know the exact legislative intent, but my, my guess is the thought is as a check on all of you so that you do put forth a transparent, robust and thorough process and select a qualified candidate that you don't do some crazy, you know, backroom thing or whatever. It's a check against the board and its significant power to appoint somebody to fill that vacancy. So that that is is out there, but um, it's it's very rare. And then the other little quirk I'll tell you, I don't think it'll apply here, but at a certain point in a term, you can't appoint. If there's only four months left in a term, you can't appoint. Um, that just has to ride out as a vacancy. I don't think that'll happen here because if you if you don't appoint, you'll have your special election in November and you will you will elect someone to fill the remainder of the last year of that term. So I don't think that'll operate here, but I just wanted to point out those two um, little quirks. Excuse me. So I'm talking a lot. I hope you have the, uh, the bulletin and the, the list of the ed codes to, to give you some guidance and some reference material as you go forward in addition to our vacancy letter. <clears throat> and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. All right, board members, I'd like to um open it up to any questions that you have. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I, so I had a question regarding if an appointment is made during those 30 days in which- I'm the having difficulty hearing you, I'm sorry. While the appointment is made, is that better? Um, after the appoint, if an appointment is made and there is 30 days for the public to challenge it, what is the, um, power of that appointed board member 
within that 30 day period. They're a fully appointed board member and they remain so unless uh, 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 the required number of validated signatures. So it actually goes beyond 30 days because when they, they have 30 days to gather the signatures and the registrar has 30 days to screen them. Um, sometimes they can do it much quicker. Sometimes they go right up to the 30th day, depending on what else they're doing to validate every one of the signatures. So the board, the person remains on the board, able to vote, able to take action. They are an appointed board member with all powers of an elected board member until there's enough valid signatures and then their, their, their appointment is vacated. Anyone else? Go ahead. Okay. So another question I had was regarding um, the public request of documents. So I noticed that the public, so all of our public documents during deliberation are made public. What about yes. other notes, for example, leading up to that, that is not actually reviewing a specific candidate? All public. Okay. And if you have a screening, remember, if you say you appoint a subcommittee or an ad hoc committee of the board, say you get a hundred applications, right? That's really, you can't sit in an open meeting and interview a hundred people and vote on a hundred people. You'll never get cohesion. So say there's a big pool of applicants. What you can empower an ad hoc committee to do is review them for qualification to be in the applicant pool. Remember, you're not, they're not, they're not view, reviewing them to say the ones they like better and recommending to the board. They're looking at things like, did you turn it in in time? Is the application complete with the, with the materials that we requested? Did you respond to the questions? Are you a resident of the district? Things like that. So they're qualifying them to get into the pool and that typically will take some people out. Um, so the pool will be smaller that the main board will consider. But uh, you know, you're not going to have a hundred. You'll probably have a handful that that end up being qualified, and that's that's always what we want. You know, you don't want one person, and you go, should we appoint them or not? You know, that's always uncomfortable for boards when there's only one candidate. Um, so we we hope that making outreach, you'll bring more people in. But everything door to door is public. You don't have to reveal people's addresses and things like that, right? You, you know, you can work with your council and you can redact material. You don't have to, to reveal personal information of the applicants, but the substance of the application could be a public document that somebody could request. Joseph, do you have any questions? Okay, um, I have a few questions for you. Um, sure. Regarding the cost of um, whether we do the appointment versus the election, what are the different costs? I know that I understand the timeline, but what's the cost of that if, there, if we can't join another election? Um, Consolidate, yeah. Well, the cost of, uh, of an appointment would be minimal. It would be your public notice costs, things like that, putting ads out. And if you if you work with a communications firm or anything like that, you know it'd be those those ancillary costs. Your election cost is a bit of a moving target, um, and I, unfortunately, I was not able to get an estimate. But you can certainly get that from the from the registrar. Uh, Dr. Wilson can request that, or I can request it. The way election costs work is is we have a formula. There is a there is a, a portal on the registrar's website where you can take sort of a gross. A calculator and, and get a gross uh, estimate. And even what the registrar would compile for you specifically would be an estimate. Everything you get from the registrar is an estimate until you get the bill. So it likely could go up. Because uh, uh, um, November of even year is not your regular election. It's not the regular election um, or, or odd year, I'm sorry, this year. So November, 2021 is not the regular election for schools. And really increasingly, it's not the regular election for, for very many districts, because most people, most, most districts, you know, hospital districts, water districts, a lot of other districts, schools included cities have been moved over to November of even year in order to boost voter turnout and consolidate elections around bigger events so that people, people will come out to vote. So this will be the November of 
odd year, I'm sorry, odd year, which used to be the big time for schools has now dwindled. I think we're only gonna have one or two schools in, in all of LA County participating in November of odd year, and they're gonna even dwindle further. So that means there'll be fewer people holding elections. That means your cost goes up. Um, because you don't have trusty areas, it's an election district wide, even though you are a small district, it'll be close or near what you typically spend for an election. So you can look at your historical election dates and then a premium on top because it's not going to be as long a list of jurisdictions holding an election in November of odd year as it would in November of even year. So that's how they do it. And there also is a base, you know, sort of an overhead charge for running an election. So you'll have you'll have just what the charge is to hold an election. You'll have the premium for it being in November of odd year. And you may have many fewer districts to consolidate and then you'll have the cost because it will be your whole district wide so what that number is off the top of my head i wouldn't know uh, but we can get that for you and that's always a good number to know because that's as close as you're going to get to a real cost for your election going forward and the, the registrar um, has an algorithm that they use to to come up with those costs um, so my next question is um we're holding everything public. We receive a number of applicants. Um, in terms of what you recommend to schedule in terms of time, depth and breadth, um, what, what might you recommend for a district our size, as well as would you make all the applications public? That means what, what the board sees, the public sees as well. I would make the names public you know, for agenda purposes, here's who we're interviewing tonight, but you can work with council and be very careful about, um, you know, your your um, requirement to, to redact personal disclosing information, right? So you, you, can, you can get an opinion on that. Typically, I have not seen the applications circulated in the public. I haven't seen that. Um, but again, I'm not an attorney, I, I couldn't rule on that. But typically you, you announce the names of who you're interviewing. And again, that's, that generates not only transparency, but public interest. If people recognize those people, they might come out to the meeting and comment or hear them and say, wow, I think uh, this one's great, that one's great. And get a sense of um, the board doing a great job selecting one of these candidates. Um, so you'd, you'd, have to, you'd have to navigate that with what is, what is required to be publicly disclosed and what isn't. There are some circumstances when attorneys have access to that information, um, but the public doesn't. And that's to, you know, to protect individuals. So you'll have to get a, get a ruling on that. But I do think that what you're looking for is about five minutes and you can time it with a timer. And if they talk too long and they run out of time, they don't get to say what they want. Um, longer than that, you really get into, you, you start to open up um, interviews that look inconsistent, because if somebody has more to say, say I've had a 20 year career in school business or school legislation or whatever, I have more to say versus somebody who, who maybe is, is newer to it and has a career in other areas. And so you, 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 you just don't want grandstanding, right? You don't want people to give speeches. You just want to get the information. You want to get a beat of their personality, their, their collaborativeness, you know, are they, do they recognize that this is a, a, a solemn public service, things like that. So I would ask them questions related to that. And it doesn't have to be a long grilling interview. It can be something, as long as it's consistent for everyone, it can be just really hitting the basics. And then I would say, now you have one minute, would you like to make a statement? Something like that. So you get that, that tone of personality and really why they're here. Okay. Anything else you guys? No? All right. Anything else? Uh, to weigh in on that question? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay, so Elise, Elise, can you please weigh in on the question regarding uh, what can be made public and what should not be made public? Sure, happy to. Um, I overall uh, overwhelmingly agree with Dr. Deegan that, that the process should be uh, public and transparency should be the goal. Um, in terms of whether the applications would be, I agree with her that I don't think the applications once submitted to the board should be circulated. Um, there's a controversial question about the Public Records Act request, which I know you guys are all familiar with. 
Um, and were we to receive a specific public records act request, we would have to go through um, and, and apply the PRA to the specific request and um, of course comply with the PRA and apply redactions um, as necessary and as allowed. But uh, in terms of it automatically being, this, uh, the applications automatically being circulated, I, I don't think that's necessary. And, oops. Yeah. And I would say even when people, you've all filed, uh, all your board members, you've filed to run for office, there are, there are a whole host of circumstances under which even your filing address and contact info can be kept confidential. Right, mm -hmm. and you have to file an application for that. So again, that's not to deceive the public who you are. It's a, it's usually related to protection. Um, so there, the, the I, my, we, our default is personal contact information and addresses must be reviewed because, in my experience, they are almost always redactable. Even when you file to run for election, it can be redacted, and that's again for protection purposes. So, so we, we you can get advice from your counsel on that. And if someone's requesting it and files a PRA, they get it heavily redacted, right? Right. And there, you know, outside of home addresses, there may be personal information the applicant right. put in there. Um, so it all just kind of depends on what exactly the requester is act, asking for and what's included in the applications. But um, I think we would both agree that an automatic distribution of the applications isn't necessary. And again, I haven't seen that. Certainly could happen, and I'm just not aware, but I have not seen that. From I, nor have I. Nor yeah. have I. Maybe up in Northern California. They always do things differently up there, but um, I just haven't seen it. And again, it's protective. So the board is informed. The board needs to know, but you know that, that would probably limit your candidate pool if they had wind that everything on their application was going to be circulated publicly before they were interviewed. Absolutely. We have a one more question. Um, I was was wondering, in terms of consistency and standardization, um, how would public comments and input from the public have to be taken into consideration with that? Well, they can comment after the interviews, right? They've just heard everyone be interviewed, and the board is about to start deliberating or taking action if they choose to do it at that same meeting. So the public, like any other um, agenda item, can come. Well, I've heard it from a lot of great people tonight. I, I love Joe. I love Jane. Or I don't like any of them. I think you should keep looking. The, you know, the public can say what the public's going to say. Um, if it, you can also set a protocol where you're not going to invite lobbying for what candidate or not. You know, it's not that kind of a thing. So just like you have um, a prescription for public comments. Um, and the ability to limit them if they're not responsive or not so many and the same thing. So you can you can make a protocol for public comment so that if the public is in attendance when this happens, they feel that they have their ability to address the board like they, they do on any action item and um, it doesn't go off the rails and, and become a rah-rah thing. Yeah, so I would talk all about that and just set those parameters before that interview meeting. And so you would recommend putting public comment in after interviews were conducted? Well, absolutely, because then the public feels a maximum of transparency, right? They got, to, they got to hear all these, they got to weigh in, they got to tell the board what they think, and then the board's gonna do what the board's gonna do versus, well, we didn't even get to tell them which one we liked or who we thought was good or what we thought of their whole interview process or, you know, that's when the public is troubled, when it doesn't have the ability to provide that feedback. So I would engineer a, a protocol with, within limits as well, because like I said, you don't want people expressing their vote for one candidate or another with no other qualitative input, right? Um, that's not gonna be helpful to the board. This guy like that person, that's not gonna help the board, right? What is gonna help the board is things like, I'm great to see that half the candidates here are teachers or that people have deep experience with the schools or some retired board members are in this pool. It's a great day for San Marino. You know, you want your, your community to validate the process, not, not be disruptive of it. But we're not obligated to ensure standardization or consistency in any public comments no. made for each candidate. Right, right? You, can be, you can standardize, like I said, that's where you can use your timing discretion to in effect standardize it. Dr. Deegan, uh, what is the suggestion uh, for application period? Like what span of time should we leave an application open? 
Well, since you have 60 days and you've already burned probably a week of that, right? Or maybe maybe even a couple of days more, I would say at least three weeks because you really want to be able to circulate word. And when we're in the school's world, we think everyone's hanging on every every word we say. And sometimes it seems that way. The public is is deeply interested in everything that goes on, but there are vast swaths of the public that may not be for very good reasons as deeply engaged. They may not have even heard about it. And you don't want anybody rushing or you don't want a great candidate that couldn't get it together. They didn't even hear about it to get an application in. So at least two weeks, two weeks seems quick to me, um, given how disjointed everyone is and, and many people are still not in their offices and don't have their current resume ready or whatever. Certainly they have to make an effort and they have to, they have to follow what you're prescribing. But I would, I would say at least two weeks, maybe three <clears throat> from when you open your application period so that you really can have a good run of the, of the community and that you all can, can continue your outreach. Like I said, go to former board members, retired board members, go to the chamber, go to the city, go to the community college, go to the Lions Club or whatever, wherever people gather, go to, go to some activist groups as well, where you might find some really exciting candidates um, who are interested. As long as they live in the district and you know they're eligible in your, in terms of your base qualifications, you want enough time. Oh, applications are still open a couple more weeks. We'd love to see you in the pool. You know, you want to be able to make make that effort and really give people time instead of well, it's due on Friday, so you know we're running out of time. That's not a good a good way to get a nice complement of candidates, in my experience. Okay. We have a couple more questions. We have a couple more questions. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that everything must be done during regularly scheduled board meetings, or can special meetings be scheduled as long as there is sufficient time built into that notification? Yeah, you can have special meetings. My recommendation is regular meetings because that's what your community knows, right? So there's less of a chance of people feeling disenfranchised. I didn't know. If you must go to a special meeting, which we know sometimes you do, especially as we get into summer months and there are fewer meetings on the agenda, um, I would do my best to make it at the same time, make it on the same day of the week if you can, right? So say you have meetings every other Wednesday or whatever, make it on the other on the third Wednesday. That just helps the community to know because some people just check for the agenda every every month or every week. And if it's just really a unique time that is difficult to get to, like like during the weekday, um, it just raises a, a concern in the community. And I wouldn't, and let, there have been certainly times when that could not be avoided because of the deadline, because of a lot of things. And during COVID, you know, we're doing a lot of things in a unique way on unique schedules. But if you can avoid it, I would be very thoughtful about those dates so that you could have it as close as possible to a regular board meeting. And if not on a regular board date, at least at a regular board time and maybe on a regular board day of the week so that the public is more inclined to be able to access that meeting. And then my other question is, um, are there any other than the normal qualification for being a registered voter of the district at the time of nomination, are there any other legally require, legal requirements that need to be met or that may not be included in qualifications? Not that I'm aware. Um, you don't wanna preclude someone who is a homemaker. You don't wanna preclude someone who is very prominent in another area, another industry and has, has not served in the schools yet. Um, people who tend to serve their community do it in many, many ways. Some through their church, some through nonprofits, some through the parks department or, or sports leagues or whatever. I would say if you had a baseline qualification, it would be that they're interested in what the schools are doing and they should be able to articulate why. You know, you don't want, hey, I'll, I figured I'd try this. I'm like, well, I've done a really great job with the, with the, um, you know, the, the, the soccer league and I did this and I did that and I expanded to this and that. And this is, you know, this is a natural progression for me to, to really be interested in the schools. You know, we all, we all had kids that go there, we blah, blah, blah. So they should be able to articulate why this, why now? But um, I would, I would, I would encourage you all to be very open-minded about what constitutes community service and community experience, and then ultimately community interest. You may find someone who's really financially oriented, that would be a great board member. You may find somebody who's attorney. You may find somebody who's a social worker. You may find somebody who's a university professor. All those things that in one way or another will intersect with the business of the schools and would be great 
great skill set to add to your board. Or like I said, it could be a, a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad. It could be a grandparent who raised, you know, 10 grandchildren through the district and has been around for years. So be open-minded to what service looks like, but I would ask about what service you've done broadly and what service you're interested in doing when you come here. If they can't articulate that, I would wonder, you know, what the motive is, but it shouldn't be bounded by industry. It shouldn't require former board service and it shouldn't require uh, volunteering or having served the schools in particular, because, you know, your, your community um, specifically, you're one of those rare, rare communities in LA County. We only have two where your, your city boundary is very close to your school district boundary. Not, not exact. There's still all along the edges. Uh, there, there, there's property lines that go through. Um, but that makes you a very, very uh, unique community in many ways, deeply, um, deeply devoted on many, many levels. So basically anyone who's, who's of service in, in the city of San Marino and San Marino USD, in my mind, that would start off being a great candidate. And then I would ask them to articulate what they've done, why they've done it, what they intend to do here. Thank you. Um, any other questions from other board members? And one other thing I would say is, uh, I, I assume, you know, just from what I've seen of the district's website, there's a lot of transparency there. There's a lot of material there. I don't know if you archive your recordings of your meetings, um, but if you don't, that would be something that I would make sure is available so that somebody who really wants to do some studying as they apply or as they, as they qualify and move into an interview, um, be as transparent as you can about what your board's work looks like. You know, is there are there subcommittees? Look at the bond oversight committee. Look at the look at the parcel tax committee or whatever. Um, look at some of the things that have been challenges. I'm sure there's a lot of of um, challenges that have been articulated in the past 14 months as we've all gone through this this incredible transition. I would I would make sure that it's easily uh, accessible as much information about how your board and how your district works because then that would be a, a highly prepped candidate who comes before you who's I've, I've watched all your past board meetings this year i've looked at this i've looked at that i think i'm a good fit you know you want that you don't want somebody who who doesn't really know what the board does so your your onus in that in that equation is to have as much material available as possible any any others Take your time. Can't tell if the board thing is frozen. Oh, I see somebody moving. Um, and you know, you you need a comfort level with the process as well. So anything you want to ask that'll that'll encourage you. A big decision, but yeah. it's one that you know you 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 all you all. Um, it's included in your oath to make this decision. So hopefully you'll be able to get through the process and have another colleague and you can move forward. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Keegan. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. And my number is in that bulletin, the one, the process of filling a vacancy my LACO number is there. So if anyone has any questions, don't hesitate. And you can either send them through Dr. Wilson um, and we'll, we'll answer as much as we can and you know support the whole life cycle. Okay. And Elise Nichols, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Absolutely. Thanks for having thank me. You. Good luck. Thanks both of you. Bye. Thank you. All right. We need to um, look at some of this. Yeah, so we'd love for the board to provide staff some direction. Um, just as a reminder, after the 25th, there are two more regularly scheduled board meetings for the school year on June 8th and June 22nd. So as you start to kind of put these dates together, one of the things that she talked about is an application period of two to three weeks. And we'd love to know your comfort level on that. but. Let's say that even if, let's say you directed us based on some input tonight to put out an application this week, 
if it went out on the 19th, which is two days from now, two weeks out would be June 2nd. And reminder that we have a board meeting June 8th. So if you wanted to keep it open longer, you could go to say Friday the 4th, uh, then we'd have to have a screening special meeting, I suppose, between the 4th and the 8th, or you would stretch it out further and look at more of the screening at June 8th and perhaps the next round on June 22nd, but that likely would put you into July or late June with an additional meeting. And just to confirm at this point, we do not have any meetings on our calendar in July. That's correct. And this has to be filled by July 11th anyway. Yeah, the date that was, I think it was July 11th, that's correct. Yes. If we're gonna do a provisional appointment, it must be done before July 11th. So, you know, I, I did put some dates down there on the bottom. Um, one piece to consider is that the board could do steps four, five, and six all in one evening. That's something that Dr. Deegan confirmed. I don't know what your comfort level would be with that. Uh, but if you, if you directed us to advertise, Dr. Choi has an advertisement ready to go, right? Um, that we could get out to the Star News, the Tribune. Uh, we would go through constant contact, put it on the website, likely send it to the chamber and the city like she suggested. Any, any other suggestions would be, would be open to it. We could get that out, you know. Chinese. Chinese, uh, yep, absolutely. Chinese club, World News. City Club, uh, yep, all the newspapers. All of them. We could accomplish that in the next two days. We could probably have it done by tomorrow afternoon if you wanted us to. When would they actually, uh, when would they actually be posted? Like, for example, if we put in the Tribune, it won't come yeah, out until Thursday or Friday. Right. So when are, when are we looking at for actual public publication? Well, our, our 11,000 or roughly 11,000 constant contact list, that would be immediate. Um, the website would be immediate. Um, yeah, you're right. The Tribune would be next week. Star News, and I'm not sure what their deadlines are. You know, Steve? They do not know specifically, um, but it's weekly. Okay. So we could, I mean, there's one option is you wait till it's advertised everywhere and then you submit the, put the application live or we do it concurrently, um, leaving it open for two to three weeks as she suggested. I, I'm thinking we probably need to start with the shoot, shoot for a date. We want to actually have the appointment made on our work our way backwards, right? Yeah, I think so. So her suggestion being that we try to have the main portion of this done in regular session. You have your choice of June 8th, which is an aggressive timeline, or June 22nd, which is less aggressive. I think we start for June 8th. For June 8th? Um, because today's the 17th, so we would technically have three weeks exactly, right? So if it's if you're ready to go on constant contact, and I mean it won't get into the newspapers until next week, I think at this point. But if you can currently go ahead and put the applications out uh, tomorrow or Wednesday then you couldn't have them all back by the 8th. Yeah, so, so yeah, one option would be leave it open to the 8th and then you do the screening on the 8th, you could do that. And then you could do the interviews on the 22nd. And then we would do- But you'd, you'd have to swear them in that night or you- Yeah, right. we'd shoot for swearing them in that night then. Which she said is done, I, we probably should have asked her that again, but she did tell me that often they do steps yeah. four, five, and six. She wrote that down here too. In one sitting. I mean, yeah, and as she said, we've already lost a week, so I don't, I don't know why we would wait longer. Okay. And also, I mean, people are going to start leaving for summer break. Mm -hmm. And so is it not possible to actually do the interviews on the 8th? 
you could probably have two open sessions. You could have an early open session and screen the applicants. And I mean, that's a question we could ask council too. Could we actually do screening, interview, uh, appointment and swearing in in one night? I mean, that's possible. But, and, the, and the screening is very simple. It really is just determining if the candidates are eligible. Well, wouldn't we be doing that as we get them, or do we do that all in one? All We're going to need to do it all in open. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So then we would do that. By the way, did, you know, one thing I was going to ask, because in your packet I gave you, Steve gathered a bunch of these great applications. The Mendota one, mm -hmm. that's where I, it, so the last one I gave you is one I prepared on in forms and you know again you can do whatever you want to do with that but mendota is the one that had the uh, 18 years old uh certified california voter and a resident of the district so i do believe those are the minimum requirements that's what i thought you meant yeah, yeah. that's what i was asking okay. so if we built that in then that's a really fast way to that's screen trainer, right then yeah. and there whether or not they move to the next that's correct point. Yeah. So that's not in the draft you made yet, right? So it's in this document that I've created, but again, you, you may choose. I mean, there's a lot of options here. She did say keep it simple, and the Palace Verdes one is very simple, if you saw that one. Uh, it's that one page, right? It's got like five questions or four questions on it. But we could add, you know, we could add elements here like the screener. Um, I, I do think that helps cut down on time mm -hmm. to add that certification of qualifications that's in the Mendota one mm -hmm. in two hours, that just becomes a really easy one. Now the advantage of doing, you know, the reason I put it in the form this way is there's more check boxes so you wouldn't have to spend as much time looking at narratives. Now there's, there's some narrative questions obviously, but uh, for instance, like community organizations, um, if you're interested in knowing about that or you know where the kids are going to school or if they're not going to school or if the candidate has no children so we can do as much as possible in checkbox or multiple choice that would speed things up as well i think we should decide on some of these things because they can't just go out and say there is an application when there right. isn't one. Yeah, so absolutely. we need to kind of make some decisions about that. So, so I, I believe the board should probably take action on a timeline and then move to an application process that includes questions on an application. So one suggestion is that we would have essentially almost a three week or a three week open application period starting tomorrow, if which will we'll focus our attention on getting the questionnaire right. Um, and then that would remain open till perhaps the noon or a, a specific time. Remember she said set a real specific firm time uh, on June 8th or whatever date the board chooses. So my question around that is, if we need to publicly post our agenda on the 4th, then wouldn't we need to, I guess I'm wondering, are we going to post the names on the agenda or do we just post that we're discussing them and then they're shared at, on the 8th? Because that affects our timeline of yeah. deadline of when the application would yeah, be due. We well, can't I, post until we've seen it's, you know, because if somebody's not yeah. eligible and we posted their name, I was going to suggest we we close it on Friday the fourth, only just yeah. because that builds in a little cushion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if we close it on the eighth, that doesn't really give us much. Yeah. No. So that that would be about two little under uh, two and a half weeks that the application period would be open. Um, and then if the board chose to have a separate screening before the eighth, they could. But I think the eighth is likely the best time for that. I think so too, and I. So can this go out in constant contact tomorrow? Yes, it can. As okay. long as you guys and are it okay can be it. posted on the website. Yep. 
by tomorrow. And we'll get it to the chamber and the city, any place that we can get it to. The only slowdown would be the two newspapers like Exactly. Right, which it won't get to till probably right. next week. Do we have the um, contact information of all of the community groups that we can share with them so they can push it out through their networks as well? Or is that not something we would want to do? We can, we, we can, we, we can reach out to the community groups, um, but generally most of the community groups are on our constant contact. Uh, okay. We have over 11,000 subscribers. We have a city club this week, right? So perhaps even that word can get out through city club. I don't know if that's possible or not. She knows somebody in city. Club. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got some weight there. Got some pull. Um, I'm I'm still thinking that Dr. Hagen said that we need to have three weeks. So if we count that we um, we post on the 18th on some of the medias and websites. One, two, three we still should close June 8th, and then we should have a meeting on the 15th, add the meeting on the 15th and give ourselves the full 15th to make that decision. Like what she's saying, what I heard her say was not that we're having a closed session or surprise meetings, it's still on a Tuesday, it's still gonna be seven o'clock but give ourselves the time to really have um, three full weeks because then we don't have somebody pushing back and demanding that we have a special election and we push back to November. I believe that if we take all the steps and um, be as transparent as possible, if we say three weeks, it's three weeks, we can say two and a half weeks and then justify that we're gonna close it on the fourth so that we could decide on the eighth. I think we can still have the meeting on the 15th. Uh, no, the the 13 to 17, uh, I, I, I'm out of town now. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my concern too about that is people are really gonna start leaving out of town. Um, but I also do hear your concern that there could be pushback that we didn't give enough time. Because if we get pushed to an election, I, I strongly believe that it's going to cost a lot of money because it's not on an election year. And let's say that um, we find out it's $100,000, then we just made, you know, kind of a, a misstep there. Because well, we don't want the right. community to say, look, you know, two weeks is not enough. I've got my son's graduation. We've got, you know, my, my nephew is graduating from a college. We've got all these activities, and then you want me to to apply, or you want? Well, um, okay. So, if we were to close it on June fourth, I mean, is there somewhere that says that we have to give exactly a certain number of days? No, she she said all along two to three weeks, but the suggestion, the more time you give, the less you're going to be accused of not being open and transparent. So I think, you know, that's that's between two and three weeks. But I think, though, if we, you know, make sure we send it out like tomorrow, every possible place we can and, uh, you know, including even Facebook, I think, <laughs> and have all of the principals uh, put it in their newsletters. I mean, if we just go to every single possible place, I mean, I think it's also even worth you, Dr. Wilson, putting a, one of your videos together yeah. and getting that out tomorrow. Sure. I mean, one option, Mrs. Ryan, is we could leave it open to the 7th, which is exactly three weeks from right now. And you could you could have a Monday night meeting to screen, and then the eighth you could do the interview. We, it, that way, it's somebody could we could say three weeks from the board meeting tonight is the seventh. We would need to have the application though ready, right, for by tomorrow. interested parties by tomorrow. Right. Yeah. So that, that there are some the decisions that we need to make on that. Yeah. Yeah. And. I personally think that this one that we made is too long. Okay. I think the Mendota one, I mean, what does everyone else think? But I think that the Mendota one is 
completely sufficient. So if I'm understanding your, um, your wishes, it has to do with if we go out tomorrow and we have the application ready that we'd like to close June 7th. And are we doing a screening? Let's say, let's say uh, a certain time and then the board would meet that night to screen. Right, so we would close it at like 3 p.m. or yeah. 2 p.m.? Four. To, or four. You want four? Well, the problem is, what does what has to happen between the close and our session? So does yeah, staff we, have to? Prepare? Yeah, I think Jennifer would have to print everything, right? Get it prepared for all the board members. So I'd I'd suggest you close it earlier in the day, like noon, right? And then by five p.m., I think Jennifer, would you be able to have everything ready by five? So then uh, again, it would just be a matter of uh, confirming the eligibility of the candidates. So if we're having a meeting on the 7th, it is literally just to look at all the applications, confirm their eligibility. Um, what information will be shared with the public at that point? On that seventh meet, at that meeting on the seventh, we'll consult with council. But my suspicion it would be the names of the candidates who meet the eligibility on requirements. The who would then be invited to the eighth interviews? So the screening is not an open session. No, it would be. It would I think be. everything needs. To yeah, be it has to be all open. open. So after we screen, we're going to. Now the only exception to that is if the board appointed a subcommittee of the board to screen applicants, but. I think if we want to be completely out there, upfront, transparent, and open, we do that in an open setting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Sweet. So on the seventh, we confirm eligibility. We, in the public session, we talk. We bring up all the names, mm -hmm. and then the actual interview happens on Tuesday the eighth. Correct. Unless the board opts to do something different, either through a special meeting on the 15th or the 22nd, it really is up to the board. Is it possible to interview the candidates on the 7th? I think we're rushing it at that, that, that point. Yes, yeah, that's not a regular session either. Yeah, we want to I be able to stay that. within regular session as much as possible. So the thought is we bring up all the names and go through the confirmation of eligibility on the 7th. And then we invite all the candidates right. on the eighth to interview in open session. And that just gives you a little bit of cushion in case on the eighth, you you know, if we're trying to get through steps four, five, and six on the eighth, but let's say you folks need more time for discussion, right? You could then have a little bit of time built in either to schedule a special meeting on the 15th or to come back on the 22nd with the actual decision and swearing in. The other option would be to do the screening on the regular meeting of the 8th and either set a special meeting on the 15th, as Mrs. Ryan suggested, for the interviews or try to do it all on the 22nd, but that backs us into a little bit of a corner. What's the rest of our calendar agenda look like for the 15th and the 22nd? I mean, the 8th and the 22nd. We got the budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to try to bring the budget to the board at the first meeting in June if um, we can complete that. Um, we do have the LCAP, right? So that's going to be the eighth. Oh, the LCAP public the LCAP hearing. public hearing, budget public hearing on the eighth. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to wrap up at the end of the board year. Yeah, but uh, right. <laughs> so I would say build as much cushion in as, as you feel comfortable. Uh, by, by the way, I just, you know, I just follow our regular meeting. So the I take uh, the the 15, I'm not able you're not, to that's do right, the 15. Yeah. Okay, got you. Yeah. So we have on the eighth, we're looking at the LCAP certification. We have to cert are we certifying three different LCAPs? Yes. Oh, <laughs> are you sleeping back? <laughs> okay. So we're looking at LCAP certification, three of them, plus the budget on the eighth. Okay. So let's say on the eighth, we interview the eligible candidates. Um, and we and how does the voting work? Well, 
I think it's going to be work like um, when you seat board offices. I think someone's going to make a motion uh, at some point, and if it's seconded and at least three board members vote in the affirmative, um, that's essentially how it'll go. But again, we will have counsel available to guide us through that. But I think initially it'll be a discussion of all the interviews and uh, everything's done in the open. So really it's a matter of that's when the board members weigh in and provide their insights from their note taking and their thoughts. And then uh, again, somebody will make a motion and it will either be acted on or not. And then we have to allow for public comment. Correct. So we also should decide where we're going to allow the public comment. Is it after each speaker or at the very end? And then if so, how many speakers we're going to allow? That should probably be decided. Um, for instance, let's say that we have eight applicants that are eligible and qualified. So eight times five minutes, right? That's time allotment. Then at the end of that time allotment, we allow public comment, how many should we uh, allow and how long? So if say 10 people wanna call in and we've said previously, it's a 20 minute time you know, allotment, then everybody has two minutes to speak. Or do we want to expand that because this is a very important decision, how do we wanna handle it? We should discuss so that no one is surprised, right? They call in and go, well, she gave me 30 seconds, you know? So. So my feeling on public comment is that everyone should be heard and they should be able to take the time that they need. I mean, I think. I think what you, I think you're gonna need to, um, a, we have to have parameters with public comment, but for a special meeting like this, you can set those parameters differently. Uh, I think everyone should be able to speak, and I think that everyone should be given at least two to three minutes to speak. Anyone, anyone else? Can we come back to that after? I feel like we're jumping yeah. around right now. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> and it, as well, I also want to be mindful of our staff and our community. Um, oftentimes, I've heard from community members that when we go into 11 o'clock at night, no one is really hearing what we're saying. And we don't want to have where, you know, there are 10, 12 candidates, and then we've got to go to like the next meeting. We don't want to carry over because it's not fair. I would like to say that on the other hand, I have heard from many community members that it's unfortunate that we as a board are not able to hear them out, yet we as a board take our time in making our own public comments. So, you know, I think we have to really be mindful of, you know, if we, if we're going to be, you know, uh, making a lot of comments, we have to be available to the community to hear them as well. So, you know, I think, so I guess what I'm trying to say is when we make our comments at the beginning and talk about, you know, where we've been for the week and, you know, what we're thinking about, maybe we need to tailor those comments down to two or three minutes so that we also are being respectful of everyone's time. But we're also the ones who are elected to fill this position, not them. <laughs> Sorry, I feel that needs to be said. I mean, I, I, I fully respect their opinions and input from the community, but they have multiple means by which they may contact us yes. and multiple opportunities. And oftentimes they use that public comment time to um, not, I, I think people enjoy hearing other people's comments. But I think that there's a certain point at which we need to hear their comments, but it's more about hearing, letting other people hear their comments. And maybe that's something we need to think about in order to share public comments like the city hall, the way the city does it, where they share, I don't know. That, well, but that's a different conversation. Well, let me, and also let me remind the board that board bylaw 9323 uh, subsection five says a person wishing to be heard by the board shall first be recognized by the president and then shall proceed to comment as briefly as the subject permits 
Individual speakers shall be allowed five minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. So uh, my guidance would be that uh, we continue to follow board bylaw 9323, which gives the board president the exceptional uh, power to extend that time, of course, with the board's consent. So in, until that board bylaw is changed, um, that's currently what we have to operate within. I think if we give a set time, two to three minutes, I think is what you would propose. If we said two to three minutes and we gave that same kind of parameter, one minute open, or yep. you may offer public comment, maybe this is an opportunity if people can issue a public, I don't know. I think I do think allowing the public to, imp, to provide input on this issue more than anything else we've done yep. is probably very critical, yep. is definitely very critical. Um, but I am concerned about the time and what else we need to get through on the agenda for that day. So can I clarify kind of where we've been? So right now, I think the proposal is that we would keep the application period up until Monday, June 7th at 12 noon, that the board would meet at 5 p.m. for a special meeting to screen the applicants, ensuring that there's an eligible pool of candidates. Also, that will give you, let's say we have a large number, one of the things Dr. Deegan mentioned to me previously was the board can use criteria to trim down the pool. Like, let's say, it's not going to happen, but let's say 20 people put in. There could be criteria the board uses to, um, like we do in an application process for a position here, to trim that pool down. Or the board could say, no, we're going to interview 20 people. And then, you know, likely we would have to extend the meeting to another day or have uh, a whole separate day where it's a five or six hour period. And the other piece of that is also the interviews can be fairly brief. I mean, she said she's seen as, as short as five minutes, <laughs> which may not give us enough time. But again, that's something the board could decide on. You could set, let's say there's five candidates and you say, I want to give each candidate 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Well, I mean, so we will have their applications, which will have all of these answers on there. Right. So in the oral interview, what more will we be trying to accomplish? Well, but the public won't be seeing the applications. Yeah. So exactly. So what? So one option would be that each board member could, you know, we could agree in advance to say each board member has one question they can ask to all candidates or two questions. Uh, uh, that's one option. Or you could have an open-ended question that could simply say, would you spend five, between five and 10 minutes uh, giving us the best reason why you should be the next uh, board member here on the board? I mean, it can be open-ended or it can be very specific questions. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's the reason, you know, I support, you know, the more page for them to fill up. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, then you, 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 can, you can read, so then later you, you will have less question to ask, yeah. I think if you ask two questions each, you're looking at a minimum of 30 minutes. Right. A minimum, right. as an experienced interviewer, I'm telling you, it, it goes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you have more information in front of you and then you ask one question each, maybe that's a possibility. I, I would agree with uh, Board Member Chang about wanting to have as much information as possible in front of us then on paper in the application um, without it being too cumbersome or burdensome to the applicant. But at the same time, if it's too burdensome and cumbersome to fill out an application, then it's too burdensome and cumbersome to serve yeah. on this board. Yeah, that's very true. Okay, so could we perhaps drill down on the timeline and then we can look yeah. at the, uh, the application together? Would that be okay? So, okay. So then as it sits right now, and, and just to be completely open to the board, I'm not in town the week of the 5th through the 12th. Uh, Mrs. Ryan knew that, but that's fine. Dr. Delatore will sit in my spot. It's, it's mainly a board function that night anyway. Um, but we have June 7th, 12 noon application closed. Do we have agreement on that? I, I don't know if we need action or... And then June 7th, 5 p.m., board meets for screening applicants. 
and, and we're sharing the pub with the public at that the point names. the names right. only is that too is is that too late to post so let's say that we take um, an hour and a half to screen so mm -hmm. that'll take us to 6 30 then we provide the list and then we post it is that too late to post because so i guess the question is do we have to have the names in the agenda for the eighth i think that's a question for council but i don't recall uh, mr Tung indicating that you needed to be that specific you just simply have to do it in open session and have an item on the agenda that allows you to have that conversation in open session so i don't know of any requirement where you would have to list the names. And, and by the way, we have to post that agenda three days prior anyway, it's a regular meeting yeah. on the 8th. So basically if we back it up then, so June 4th, we're posting the agenda indicating- The, the item. Indicating the I, indicating that the 8th, okay, do we need, I'm thinking, do we even need, what do we need to post Well, in so terms for the, of the 7th, 7th, we just need to post by Sunday, but we'll, I think we'd likely post by Friday or Saturday for the 7th. Okay because that's a special meeting, so 24 hour notice. The eighth is a 72 hour notice, so we would post that by Saturday at the latest, but normally Friday. Indicating that we will be sharing all applicants, but not the names, because we won't Correct. have them at that mm -hmm. point. Right, okay. Right. Okay. I'm confused, but I thought that the purpose of the meeting on the seventh was to be able to share all the names. It's, it's to confirm the eligibility of all the applicants. But we won't have so the let's, names. So if we get 10 process. applicants. So we just say that we're post, that we're, it's going to be like saying that we're going to be posting it, but we won't have the names. So as long as it's on the agenda that we're posting the names. Could you guys unmute so oh. that the recording, because it, it seems like it's a private conversation. I'm just pointing out okay. that. <laughs> We could get the council back on the line if we need to right mm -hmm. now, right? I Would you guys so. like us to try to get council back on? Um, let me see. And it's up to, to the board if you want us to. Yeah. Just we, to make sure know, that we, we have our time. We talk a lot about the importance of um, having the community participate. And so I'm just wondering, um, it'd be great if we only had you know half a dozen six applicants but we're trying to get lots of quality applicants so mm -hmm. if we're going after 10 12 15 um oftentimes i'm hearing from the board that you need time to kind of process and think because we want to be able to articulate the why the why we're saying something because these are community members that are putting themselves out there to apply to be before the board and it and we should be respectful of the time that if they take time and they write you know a four six page you know um essay that we spend some time looking at it so i'm just worried that we decide and and we give the list to jennifer at 6 30 then we go home right and we're going to take copies and and look it over and then we have to understand that each of us have one question to ask and then um, go through and weed all, all of this because we want to make sure that the community gets a call in. Julie pointed out, make sure everybody has two to three minutes and everyone that calls in, um, phones in, whatever, should be able to speak. To anticipate that with the LCAP, with the budget, which is very important right now, um, is going to take a little bit of time. I just don't want to go, you know, two days because it's not fair to the applicants if some go on one day, and you know, right? Because it's a, it's a, equity, fairness, um, transparency, and so we want to make sure. I mean, I, I really want lots of quality applicants to come out. So. Guys, if you're listening out there, we want you to apply and uh, we want to get the best candidate to serve our community. I don't want to narrow down the field and rush through it because overnight, it's very hard to come up and articulate, um, you know, the various characteristics that we're looking for. And it needs to fit with our board as well because we need to do a lot of work and working together. 
And so that piece is a little bit harder to define. You know, the ability to work together and to move our district forward, so. So given that, are you not comfortable with doing the interviews on the 8th and prefer to push it out? I'm not sure I understand what the timing well, we're considering. Well, here. yeah, we, we are um, pushing it pretty quick, you know, and we're not having much time. Even when we have a board packet, we have the entire weekend to kind of think about it and to articulate questions for a cabinet or, you know, um, the decisions that we have to make. Well, even though she suggested um, not having a special meeting on this, I think if we posted in constant contact the application and the exact timeline for this, saying that we are going to um, confirm eligibility and, and discuss all the names on Monday the 7th, and then we are going to do interviews, let's say the 10th, then it's out there right as opposed to so then we can keep the meeting on the 8th to just be about everything else that it needs to be about because it sounds like your concern is that now we're packing so much into one day so what i'm saying is what if then we let the community know via constant contact in every other way here's the application this is the timeline regarding uh, filling that position and that is getting all the applications by noon the 7th. We will have open session the evening of the 7th and we will have uh, the interviews, let's say on the 10th, because it sounds like we need to do it all that week since um, board member Chang will be gone the week after. And I don't think we should wait until June 22nd. But at that point, if all we're doing is screening, I don't see why we're doing it on the 7th if we're not gonna do the interviews. Then we may as well do the screening on the 8th at our regularly scheduled board meeting if we're going to schedule a special meeting anyway. Right? And then just another, oops, on here, just another option uh, would be to close the application period on the 4th as we suggested earlier, which again, it's not quite three weeks, but it's two and a half weeks. That would give the board a screening period let's say on the fifth, if you guys wanted to do that. I just think one of the things she said was anything you do consequentially should be done in a regularly scheduled time, even if it's Tuesday at 7 p.m., another Tuesday. But again, Mr. Chang will be out of town on the, on the 15th. So that's just another option. So Dr. Wilson, your recommendation is that we close uh, June 4th and set a time for us to review and then have everything on June 8th at regular session. So the interview, the LCAP and the budget. All right. Not the interview, interview. not the interview. That's, that's, I won't say that's my suggestion, it's an option. Just I the think. screening, not the interviews. Well, if, if you didn't Confirming do, the if, eligibility. If you, then, then you're pushing the interview down to the 22nd if you're gonna follow this idea of doing it on a Tuesday at 7 p.m. because Mr. Chang is out of town on the 15th. But so I'm I, suggesting you make it a special meeting of interviews on the 10th. You're right. And I think that I think the issue about the special meeting is when you don't tell the community until the week before. I think that if they understand tomorrow via constant contact, this is our plan. Here's the application. It's due by the 7th um, or it's due by Friday, June 4th. We're going to go over the eligibility at the June 8th meeting, and we're going to have a special meeting with interviews and make the appointment on Thursday the 10th. If everyone knows that right now and that's out there, I think that's plenty of time. I mean, Mr. that Ch is Mr. effectively four weeks. Yeah. And Mr. Chang, you're here on the 10th still. Well, I'm, I'm okay there. Um, you, you know, the, the reason, you know, I, I, I already uh, take uh, 13 to, to 17 uh, because uh, regularly the, the between the two school board meetings. Right. So mm -hmm. that, that's the week I, I went to, I'm going to see my son for the entire six months. 
Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. But it is the tenth. Work yeah, 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 can, uh, yeah, I'm available. Okay. Yes, yes. So, Mrs. Chandler, would you like to suggest that timeline again for me so I can just jot it down here? So, yep. the screening would, I mean, the applications would close when? And, and, and then we'll need a motion. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. after that. So let's run through it one time and then. So, the thought, my thought would be that the constant contact with the application and the timeline will go out Tuesday, May 18th, tomorrow morning, if possible. And it will include the fact that the application is open and will be closing on Friday, June 4th, uh, maybe at noon, so that Jennifer has enough time to get it all together on Friday the 4th. And then we are having, and then on Tuesday, June 8th, we would confirm eligibility and go through the list of names of applicants. And there will be a special meeting on Thursday, June 10th, beginning at 7 p.m., which is regular open session time. You might want to go five in case there's a large number of applicants. Okay, sure. So 5 p.m., June 10th, open, open session where we will uh, interview all of the eligible candidates, make the appointment and swear in the appointee on Thursday, June 10th. I, so we're effectively only giving the public one opportunity to make public comment then on the 10th. And because if we're gonna swear them in that night, they're only allowed to make comment that one night after hearing. So they were not giving the public any time to consider anything they're here. That's a good point. Because if we're interviewing them on the 10th and we're seeking to swear them in on the 10th and the public will have no opportunity to actually provide any input from anything they hear that night other than immediately on the spot. You could have, you could have two public comment sections. You could have one prior to the interviews and then one after the interviews. Would they be able to make public comment on the eighth? Because they'll have all the names. Well, there's, you can do that on the eighth yeah. for items not on the agenda that night. Or if you're screening on the eighth, was that yeah, the plan? True. If you're screening on the when eighth, then you could uh, allow public comment if you would uh, publicly announce the names. Exactly. We could we could build that into the agenda that night. In fact, in, in our verbiage, it says that the board can allow you know could have an additional public comment within the agenda for any given item i'm 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 not sure how i feel about this timeline well but the other concern is that i mean people will be leaving so well, everyone's going to travel the month of June all over the place. Exactly. Mrs. So, Chan, what were you thinking about with regards to multiple? I'm not uh, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm hesitant to push out the appointment to 22nd because at that point, if there's a problem, we've sort of yeah. locked yeah. ourselves in. I don't think. We can. Um, but I am hesitant. But I, I'm not entirely comfortable with the idea that we're only giving the public two days within the same week to hear the names, to give us public comment and then um, swear the person in, I, I, I'm not sure, yeah. So um, just wanna remind the board that there are three ways in which public, uh, the public can make um, recommendations or comments. They can email it to all of us. Um, they can phone it in, they can come in personally. So we would encourage that by the time that we've screened and made public notice of these candidates, and that they are being interviewed, that those comments are coming in. And so we, we, can't, um, we can't dismiss the fact that we are now, on, we are already uh, in person, we are on Zoom, you know, we are by email and we are accessible. So we have to still, you know, take that into consideration because if you're thinking everyone's just coming in person and they're, you know, they can't because they're traveling, they still can, they can, 
email us, they can well, phone in or Zoom in. And that's my other question. Is it possible for this interview eligible candidates meeting to be also by Zoom? So if somebody can't come in person, but they are candidates, I don't think they should not be able to apply. Right, so that's something the, the board yeah. can decide. I don't, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see who actually requests that because it could be two, it could be four well, people, it could be not nobody. So we'll, we I, have to look at that first. I think it's important though to add that in the application, in the verbiage that goes out tomorrow, like six, like giving the timeline and saying, we, we understand that school is going to be out in a week or two and people are traveling, but we want all possible candidates to apply. So we, so this interview process will be accessible by Zoom. I think we need to put that out there now. That's, that's not a problem, Dr. Choi, right? We just you would elevate somebody to a panelist yeah. and something like that, right. right? Not a problem. Thank you, Dr. Choi. So then any candidate that's eligible that could not be here physically could be given the pa the panelist credential to zoom in. Yeah, we'll the give them the time and the panels. They'll have to wait and then we'll bring them in. But I think that just needs to be really clear in the application so that people don't think, oh my gosh, it's on June 10th. I'm going to be traveling. Yeah. I can't even I got apply. It. We'll, we'll include that. Okay. Okay. So... So just to confirm if this is gonna be a motion, the proposal would be May 18th through June 4th at noon. The application period would be open immediately. Dr. Choi will begin working on getting the information out via the website, constant contact, City Chamber of Commerce, anybody that we can share it with. Uh, along club. with newspapers, City Club, Chinese Club, uh, gosh, East Meets West, <laughs> the World Journal, anybody that we can get it to. Um, and then June 8th, would be in the regular meeting, the screening of the applicants for eligibility. June 10th at 5 p.m., there would be an open meeting of the Board of Education to interview the eligible candidates, the appointment of the successful candidate, and the swearing in of that person would all happen on June 10th. Applicants may zoom in if they're unable to attend in person. And then the following day on June 11th, Dr. Choi would make sure that we notify the Tribune Star News Constant Contact the website of the new board members. And so for the June 8th eligibility uh, and list of names, would that be public on the website before the 8th? I don't see why not. Unless there's something preventing us. Because I think what's important about that is in the event that since we are going to be giving the school community mm -hmm. a chance for public comment on the 8th and the 10th, I think it's important to also put that in there that the applicants, that all of the eligible applicants will be posted on the website on the 6th or 7th, whenever that's possible. And um, for anyone who wants to make public comments, they will be able to on the 8th and the 10th. Sorry, but if we do, if we're posting their names on the 6th and 7th, we haven't confirmed their eligibility yet. Correct. The eligibility would be confirmed on the 8th for the screening. So I think what we could do is that evening, <laughs> poor Jennifer, we could post, um, we could post the agenda for the 10th which would have the names of the eligible candidates. After we screen on the 8th. That, that evening, correct. Or at least by the morning of the 9th. I mean, we could, that might be unfair to ask. But me. see, isn't that why we need to have the meeting on the 7th then to talk about the eligibility so that on the 8th, if people do want to make comments, to your point that I agree with you, Jane, that the 10th, is not enough time to give everyone the chance to make comment just in that one session. You know, it's, it's the screening one that keeps sticking us up here.
I would say the screening process likely won't take you a lot of time because again, it's really just screening for eligibility. Right, right. So I think we should do it on the seventh. Is that what you mean? That's, that's what I'm saying. If you guys chose to go on the seventh, you could do a pretty short screening. I think that's important. So then in the actual meeting on the eighth, well, on the seventh, after we screen, feasibly that evening, we can list all of the all of the eligible candidates. Yeah, and, and certainly maybe the board president or Dr. Delatori could. And then in I the think comments list who those folks are. Right, and then on the morning of the eighth, constant contact can shoot all of those names out. Can do that. And. And the public can be reminded of the Zoom link, as well as the possibility to come in person to make any public comment the night of the 8th. Can I make a suggestion if that's the direction the board's going is, and staff chime in if you want here, just so that staff doesn't go <laughs> crazy working 24 seven, five days that Yeah, because now you have three board meetings yeah. that yeah. week. So I was gonna suggest that you do that screening meeting early in the day on the seventh, uh, so that it's within staff work hours, say 3 p.m. or something like that. Because you'll have, I mean, those applications right. will be in by the fourth, so. Right. Yes, that's fine with me. Does that work for everyone? Mr. Chang, are you okay at 3 p.m. on the 7th? Uh, well, I, I'm i thinking uh, how long it takes uh, it for take screening long. Uh, per person. I, I, I don't is, think is, a is whole that lot of time. Only check for residency right. status. How no the background check? Right? Yeah, the, the, so the check is, are they 18 years or older? Do mm -hmm. they understand that upon appointment, they're required to file the 700 form. Also, if they're disqualified, they, you know, we would find out about any convictions, crimes, et cetera, to, which would disqualify them. Also, if they're a California registered voter and if they're a resident of our school district. Okay, this is gonna sound like a dumb question, but I mean, anybody can just say yes, right? Like, don't, aren't we legally obligated to actually confirm all of this information? Isn't that uh, we'll check with council. I don't believe so. I think that could be done uh, post <laughs> as well. I don't know. Well, That's a good question. I don't know how we would confirm that in that moment. Anyway. I imagine we'd have to legally they, confirm that. They need to be responsible for making sure that the statements that they're making on an application That's are true. indeed factual. If not, they're they're going to be disqualified as a candidate. So we can put a statement on the application that clearly says that um that's that's the appropriate way i think to handle that you're not going to be able to do um background checks and we don't do background checks on board members anyway um but you're going to hold them accountable for them being honest on the application okay and, and i'll tell you what, we'll do some checking with, with council and with Ms. Yeah. dr deegan to find out i mean obviously other districts have gone through this mm -hmm. um, to find out what that requires Well, I just share with you because they have a one factor, you know, to certify uh, whether they have a condition of any of the crime. If the new resident, they just move to the San Marino. I don't know if they have enough uh, information, then they may have to check, check uh, the previous one. Yeah, that, that's the uh, water uh, when we they are working in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So they had to, once uh, the one not available, then uh, to, to check the pre previous. I don't, so that's really not consider, concern about uh, how long it takes. We can finish. Yeah, uh, we don't have a policy that says that we require fingerprinting or any kind of exhaustive background check because. Typically, board members are elected by the people to serve in this capacity. So um, it, I don't know of any process that would allow us to do a background check, but we will check with council to see if there is. So cabinet also, when it 
um, this application, the sample one with Mendota, um, also talks about um, public that public that their application is entirely in a public document and will be available in public in compliance with Public Records Act. And also that they understand you're willing to commit time and be involved in preparing for regular board meetings, special study sessions, and all that. I think we need to include that as well right. and make sure because you know these are the basic qualifications. Well, based on that, then their entire applications will be on the website for everyone to look at. Only if there's a public act, public records act. I mean, that would be something we would decide if we wanted to do it that way. So Why wouldn't we want to just put all the applications on the website? We would have to redact all the private information. And um, Dr. Vegan didn't advise for us to do that, but it can become public. We just have to notify them to let them know that if there is a public request act, that it could be made public. Yeah, and that, I use that same verbiage on ours too. I took it right off the board. I, I, hate, I hate to interrupt. I just wanted to note that council's back on the line. I apologize for the delay. We got your email. Oh, great. And I was able to join back in. I just wanted to check in and see if there were any questions. And I again, apologize uh, for the delay. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we did have a couple of questions from the board. Um, go sure. Ahead. I have to remember that now. Um, so what? So one of the questions has to do with verifying um, eligibility of candidates. Like, what response uh -huh. does the board of staff have in verifying the elements of eligibility, which include being a registered voter, a resident? Uh, uh, older than 18 and no mm -hmm. convictions. Yeah, those those legal requirements are found in Education Code 3107, I believe. Um, there only are there are only a few of them. Generally, we don't see too many issues with people being dishonest about those. But the way we would handle it, if a question were to come up, is we would be able to connect with the registrar and help the district verify as much as we can. Um, but ultimately that person will be held to the answers that they provide. Um, I'm not sure if that helps, but but truly we don't run into that as an issue. Yeah, what's very the often. turnaround time for that? I'm sorry? What's the turnaround time if you're going to um, the registrar's office to verify? Um, you know, I, I, I would hesitate to give a direct um, answer or tie into a specific timeline. I want to say that generally, they're, in my experience, they're pretty responsive. Um, I can't imagine that it would be more than a day or two. Um, but but again, I don't want to tie into a, there's no specific timeline that I can say they always respond within a certain amount of hours or days. Can I, call, can I, can I follow up something with her real quick? Okay, just a quick follow up on that. So the board is sure. looking the board is looking at the timing of all of these issues, right? And the fact that we only have regularly scheduled meetings for June 22nd, and that likely much of the community will, or many of the people in the community will go on vacation and such. So there's a timing issue here. And so would you advise, as Mr. Chang, I think you suggested earlier, having a first, second, possibly even a third uh, candidate in order so that in case, let's say candidate number one is found to be non-eligible. Is that what you would suggest or how would you su suggest we proceed? So I'm not sure that I entirely understand what you mean by first, second, and third. Um, let, me, let, me, yeah. uh, let me go back. Oh, sure. It, because of timing and the fact that we're gonna be wrapping up our, our business June 22nd, if a, let's say the board made the decision on a candidate, right, as the top choice, and then you guys did your background check and determined that candidate not to be eligible, what would be the next step for the board? Um, I would have to double check, but I would assume that if that person were, if the person were seated provisional appointment, and then that were somehow challenged either by the community or they were found to be ineligible, it would move to a special election. But I do wanna double check 
that and and can get back to you um, as soon as possible. But um, the way that it typically works is that person is seated. And if there is a challenge or an issue with their being seated, it then gets moved to special election. Elise? Yes. Clear. Um, this is Linda Delatory. We don't currently um, perform background checks, criminal background checks on board members because typically they are elected by the people to serve in this capacity. Uh -huh. So um, when we are screening candidates to be appointed to the board, there's uh, no process of which I am aware that we can undergo to do a criminal background check. Um, and all that the registrar would be doing for us would be to determine whether they are a registered voter, right? Mm -hmm. And residency, I mean, you either live in San Marino or you don't. Um, right. So we really, there's no separate background check that we should be conducting, correct? Right, I think it's just the criteria under Education Code 3107, um, which is just that they are um, 18, eligible to vote and registered to vote, mm -hmm. live within the district. Um, and then I believe that they are able to hold public office under the constitution and state law. So at least we could put some language on the application, uh, basically stating that they are responsible for providing factual information to, Absolutely. The, to the board of education. And then if there's anything that the board finds to be untrue, that would disqualify them. Right. Okay. That's correct. And so Dr. Wilson was thinking that there could be, or a member of the board was thinking that there could be a backup candidate should that happen. But what I heard you saying is that if um, a, can a candidate were to be uh, put into question by a member of the public, if their can candidacy was questioned um, and there, we found something to be inaccurate, then we would go to a special election process. You wouldn't go back to the list. Yeah, again, I want to double check that. But yes, that is my that is what all my experience is telling me there is no real mechanism for kind of ranking candidates um, and allowing the board to kind of move to the second tier or third tier of candidates, um, you know, should one tier become disqualified. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an important Thank you. Uh, clarification because that's a $100,000. <laughs> and and yeah, it, would no, third, it would be the third election that this yeah, right. small district has held in one year. So it would be Understood. very different. I'm happy to run that to ground and I can get something back to the district by tomorrow. Absolutely. Thank you. So I have a question. And so then why do we need to have this June 7th or June 8th confirmation of eligibility if we are putting in the language that they are responsible for their own eligibility and that they're being honest. You're, you're screening it like, like you would any application that comes in for a position that you're trying to fill. Um, and the board can come up with criteria if it wants to, um, you know, to determine who is eligible and who isn't. Um, so on, on its, on the, Face, they should all be eligible if they're actually going to submit their application because you're telling them what the eligibility requirements are. Um, and some people don't necessarily uh, read through things and you may get some applications that are either incomplete or have information that indicates that they're not registered to vote. And so you can set aside those applications um, on that basis, right? And then you're just looking at the applications that ha are completed and have uh, information on them indicating that they are eligible. So it's just a paper screening process that you go through. And, and Al, uh, Elise, you might want to clarify the screening of the applications. It's not necessarily law, but it's a recommended step. Yeah, I think it's according to board policy um, that we require that screening process. And again, that process is fairly simple. It's just making sure that they meet those initial eligibility requirements. So in that document I provided the board from LACO, mm -hmm. if you look at step three, it says the board should appoint staff or a subcommittee of members to review applications and qualify candidates for interviews. The review can include a check for residency and a check that the applicant submitted responsive applications that include information about the criteria the board is seeking. I would suggest that you don't assign that to staff, but you do that in open. Session. And then Elise, there was also a question from a board member about 
whether or not there is a requirement to um, post the names or to um, announce the names of the candidates that will be interviewed during an open session meeting prior to the interviews. Um, yeah, that can be done, assuming that you're gonna be doing the interviews, um, you, you can announce them and you, most districts will include them as part of the board agenda for the meeting in which the interviews will take place. That's usually how I've seen it handled. And again, not their applications, but their names. We don't have to actually post their specific names when we post the agenda. That's, that's I think, what our question was, right? Yeah. Okay. Was whether the names be included in the agenda? So if we had a meeting um, on the 7th to do the screening, and um, we had a meeting on the 8th, for the, the June 8th meeting, that's an, a regularly scheduled open session meeting. So the agenda needs to be prepared seven, 72 hours in advance and posted 72 right. hours in advance, right? Right. We didn't do the screening until the 7th. We couldn't have the names on the agenda um, because it would only be 24 hours prior to the next meeting. Does that make sense? So yes. do we have to have the names posted or is it sufficient to simply have um, an agenda item that allows the board to interview eligible candidates? Yes, uh, considering the timing that you've just laid out, it's, it would be fine to just have on the agenda, uh, an agenda item listing that there will be an interview process taking place for the eligible candidates. Thank you. So then the morning of the night, staff could put out a cost. So then the morning of June 9th, we could have staff put out a constant contact with the names of the eligible candidates. Are we still doing screening on the 7th? That's what we're talking about. So we do the screening on the 7th, and then all of those eligible candidates will then go in the constant contact to the community on the morning of the 9th. You're right, saying. and, no, and in the, the regular meeting on the 8th, either the board president or staff could announce the list of names in their report to the community. On the 8th, right, so. Or as an agenda item, either way. So the community would not necessarily, I mean, unless they're listening, they may or may not make comments because they won't necessarily know the list but we can make it available to them to make comments. I think that list, I think if, okay. So if we're screening on the 7th, at that point, we'll know who's eligible by the 8th. We can share the names on the 8th, allow for public comment, mm -hmm. and then post it additionally on the 9th, have interviews on the 10th, and again, allow for public comment before and after interviews. Yeah, I'd say before. And then depending on how, assuming that goes well, we would appoint and swear in on the 10th as well, right? So at this point we're meeting on the 7th for a quick screen. And then we have a regular meeting as scheduled with that as an agenda item on the 8th. And then we have another meeting scheduled for the 10th. And just to clarify, you, you would like the names posted prior to the meeting on the day for I don't, public viewing or wait till after the meeting? I think we would have to post it on the 8th because we're screening it on the 7th, mm -hmm. right? I just, if I can jump in really quickly just to clarify, it's up to you guys because um, your board policy is not, uh, doesn't require this, but I don't, um, it doesn't require that you do the screening process uh, during a meeting. It's a subcommittee of the board that kind of does that screening process because again, it's just weeding out those not eligible based on that education code section. Um, so that doesn't necessarily need to be done at a special meeting if that's helpful at all. I, I think the point is um, trying to give the public as much opportunity as possible to provide comments. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. 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 And, and once the, you're- And the need for transparency at this time. Absolutely. And there, there should be a time within which the applications can be submitted. 
once that deadline is done, the screening process can begin. And again, that screening process is only removing those candidates who truly do not qualify mm -hmm. under that education code section. All other applications should move through the process toward the interview. Um, and again, all that is done in open session. There should be an opportunity for public comment, um, you know, and the board should be prepared to, you know, have reasoning for their votes. And hopefully someone is provisionally, provisionally appointed at that meeting as well. You can do it at a, at, a, at a meeting if you'd want the screening process. I just wanted to throw out there that that's not necessarily a requirement if that's helpful at all with the, with the timing issues presented. So Mr. Chan or Mr. Chan Lin, uh, just to clarify so we don't mess this up. <laughs> so June 7th, 3 p.m., mm -hmm. the board would hold a short meeting to screen or however long it takes to screen the applicants for eligibility. Okay, so we'll know who that group is on the 7th. Those names will not be in the agenda on the 8th, but we will have an item in the agenda, an information item, right? That Dr. Delatore could share the names of the eligible candidates. Would you want that list pushed out prior to the meeting or give the board the ability, should something arise on the 8th, to adjust that list? In other, yeah. words, in other words, then we would push the list out after the meeting. Well, we will know that list yeah. on the 7th. Correct. So I think we should push it out as soon as we know it. I think we share it on the 8th and then allow for public comments at that meeting. So the morning of the 8th, push the list out so people know who's on the list. Yes. Okay, and then have a public comment period, I guess prior to that information item so we're not going to have an agenda item to discuss the names on the agenda for the eighth right no i think we would have an agenda oh, okay. item to suggest it. and, and, and we're pushing it out via again. constant contact we're yeah. pushing it out that morning right. got it to remind the community here is the zoom link and we will and if you'd like to make a public comment on these candidates these are this is the final list of candidates and the meeting starts at whatever time, so, and you can zoom in. Okay. Okay, so the, the list will go out. Dr. Choi's taking copious notes. I know I'm just kind of predilatory. The morning of the 8th. Right. And there will be a discussion item on the agenda that evening mm -hmm. where those names will be read aloud by Dr. Delatore mm -hmm. and for the public comment prior to that item on the agenda. And then the board will reconvene on the 10th at 5 p.m. for the interviews of the eligible candidates. There will be a public comment section prior to and following the interview. And prior to the discussion by the board. Okay. Right. And with the possibility being that the successful candidate would be appointed and sworn in that evening. Yes. Is that someone's motion? Yes. <laughs> that is my motion. <laughs> so. So June 7, 3 p.m. We'll back it up to the fourth closing date. Yes. So, so the application goes out tomorrow, May 18. With we'll the, say by noon. By noon. We'll okay. Break right. up with noon okay. on the fourth. Okay. Okay. Yes. So the application will go out May 18th by noon to the community via constant contact, and it will also list in there that it will close on noon, on June 4th at noon. On June 7th at 3 p.m., the board will meet in open session to discuss eligibility. On the morning of June 8th, the names of all the candidates will go out by constant contact, as well as, well as the Zoom link for anyone who wants to make public comment on the night of June 8th. Where, and then where it will be an agenda item right right, right. Okay. and june 10th we will interview all eligible candidates and those who cannot attend in person may do so via zoom 5 p.m correct 5 p.m open session on june 10th and okay. we will make the appointment on june 10th and swear in the appointment and we'll have public comments prior to and after 
prior to and, and after, after the, the interviews, interviews. Right. on June 10th. On the June 10th. So we are taking public comments at the June 8th open session meeting, as well as June 10th before and after the interview. And even the opportunity on June 7th prior to the screening, because that'll be an open session, there could be opportunity there as well. Okay, Can so we let's list that, that the public may comment on June 7th, June 8th, and June 10th. Can we also open up that public comment window for a longer period of time than just 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on the day? I don't know. I don't know how that works. Um, Probably should back it up anyway since the meeting is free because that takes a little bit of time to push those out. So what do you think about, I don't know, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m.? On which date? On the 7th. Is that what you're talking about? Or what, what day are you speaking of, Mrs. John? I'm not sure. I'm just wondering if we need well, to. Well, there, there are three meetings on that week, so right. they'll have plenty of time to write in. There are three meetings. So we'll move the time up, okay. but there are three meetings. So they right. can write in on, you know, I before the 7th, the 8th, okay. the 10th. I think there's enough opportunity. Right. And I think if we bold public comments can be made at June 7, Monday, June 7th, when the meeting begins at 5 p.m., Tuesday, June 8th, or sorry, 3, 3 p.m., June 8th, 7 p.m., and I suggest we just keep that one the regular comment period so we don't confuse people. And then we can go, go back on the temp on their email comment section. Okay. Um, are we going to follow the recommendation about having any hard copies? Is that going to follow the same deadline? Yeah. In okay. fact, that, I think I have that in here. Um, uh, yeah, that was part of the plan. So there's an e signature uh, possibility. Um, Oh, we have that part in here. That yeah, down at the bottom, you see, uh, I disagree and request to sign a hard copy of this application by contacting the assistant superintendent to arrange a date and time to see. And we'll make those available to the public if they want to pick a hard copy up. So, but the closing date will be the same, will remain the same. Any Correct. documents submitted as a 12 1 p.m. on the 4th, they're not going to be accepted. So, either by electronic or by hard copy, it must be turned in to the district office at noon on June 4th. Right. Okay. And then um, President Ryan, we do have that Mendo Mendota further further verification note at the end, item number 19. Yeah. So yeah. So I saw that. So Mrs. Chandler, is that motion how you want like it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I move to approve that motion. <laughs> For June 4th, 7th, 8th, and 10th. Um, I second. All right, we have a motion on the floor from Mrs. Chan Lin and from Mrs. Chong. Um, my poor staff. Uh, <laughs> I know. Um, I did get you at the 3 p.m. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. So with that, I'd like to take a roll call vote, Mr. Chang. Mrs. Chandler? Aye. Mrs. Chong? Aye. Mrs. Ryan? Aye. And also, I'd like to um, make sure that the community is aware that if um, this timeline is too restrictive, that they should let us know. But we are proceeding with the notices, advertisement, and um, application process. And um, at least those two are set in stone, right? And yep. then we can, of course, uh, hear comments to that. All right, with that. Uh, do we want to, I'm sorry to do this to okay. you, but is, are there any questions on, if, if you wouldn't mind, are we okay operating off this four page piece? And if you wanna look at the questions and if there's anything you want to redact or iterate, but I basically what I did is mostly take this from this, conglomeration of applications that we found. And if I'm missing some organizations or anything like that, just keep an email and we'll get it. 
get it in there by tomorrow morning. Like student production show, because he has access to this now. I'll let you be the keeper of the application at this point, but it's good. Um, on item number 12, where you list the organization, do we have an assistance league in San Marino? I don't think we do. Yeah, we have a national charity league. Yeah, we don't, don't have an assistant. You know, I, I googled as many organizations like <laughs> in the San Marino to get this list, but it's possible. So I don't think I, I don't think that should be assistance league. That probably I think you might have meant that as oh my God, national charity league. League. national charity league, right? NPL. Um, so the only question I have regarding I, I like the list, but I think can we ask them what role? Because I think there's a difference between being a member versus being a president. So there's a question. I mean, personally, so maybe we could eliminate that and just go with a open question about that. I think Mendota had one experience in community service boards, committees, and then it says organization, location, well, you, position health. But you already asked that. Describe any other community or business activities in which you have participated. You Number list 11. and describe the involvement. I think 10 and 11 are sufficient. I think 12 is overkill. And I also think that, you know, people will shy away if they don't have three or 10 of these to check. And I don't think that that makes or breaks somebody's so ability. I think you take out 12. I, I like the checklist, but um, it just allows you to yeah to quickly community. see that they're involved in the community. Yeah, the checklist. So then we don't need to ask what their role would be. We just want to have that as an easy reference. I just knowing as many people as I know in the community, I think that that would be a deterrent, and people might feel like, oh, well, I'm not in all of these organizations so that doesn't qualify me and i think that we are seeking applicants based on these other questions and not whether they are in all of these i will say though that sometimes when i'm writing stuff out i forget that i'm a member of certain organizations <laughs> or i might or i might end up highlighting them um, I mean, I'm thinking of like a college application where you sort of have all the checklists as well as the opportunity to provide kind of more a more qualitative. So I think the idea behind that is to give us both quantitative and qualitative quick looks at them. You know, you know, Mr. Chairman, you might actually think of it from the opposite direction. Because one of the things I was thinking about is they're over involved. Like if somebody was doing seven or eight different things, they might not have the time. It, it would just give you data. I mean, so you folks. I mean, I kind of like it. I do think that sometimes the propensity of us is to think of San Marino is to think that you only really qualify if you're a school involved member. And I do like that a lot of these are more community oriented. Um, I think the Huntington could probably say the Huntington Library, right? You know, right, exactly. And, and that's one of the things that was being suggested. He said, try to look beyond the normal sort of scope of the school, like you could do other things. Um, one question, one area, I'm not sure where it would sit if it's 10, 11, or 12, but uh, one thing I've realized about myself is that I would have probably been, I'd probably be better if I had had past experience in some other type of board, but I don't know that any of these questions really ask that. I guess maybe 11 does. 11 kind of doesn't. You could add some verbiage to some of the questions. Past board experience. I know that was a question I was often asked while I was running as well. And then I'm also wondering, and I know that this might feel burdensome and we don't have to, but I'm wondering if we can ask for a public statement that we can post. If we're not gonna share the application, can we at least ask the applicants to provide like, I mean, what was our candidate statement? Like 170, how many words was it? Oh, I don't remember. It was like, if we had a candidate statement that we could at least post, and share when we actually um, pushed out the names on the A. And if we're really clear with the applicants, this is your opportunity to make a statement, a candidate statement that will be shared with the community. Um, so that way we're not 
sharing the entire application, but this does give a snapshot for the public of who they're looking at. Because what, what if we took question 18? That's exactly what I was that. thinking. Yeah. I think we, that's we perfect. Could, we could kind of broaden yep. a little bit. Okay. Say. Yeah. And I, no, I think that's a perfect question. Is this the way you have it? Okay. And I think you just, um, in parentheses, right, this will be the answer that goes on our website. Can we add to number 18 something about, I liked how Mendota had the, what do you hope to accomplish as a board member? I think as we consider what our priorities are as a board and looking at any potential candidates and how they fit, um, this is a one year term. So it's not right. necessarily like they're going to be coming in and trying to change everything that we've been working for. Right. We what want somebody who's going to fit goal? with us. Yeah, we want somebody who's going to fit with us as well. So you would say something like, what personal and professional quality skills or strength can you bring to the board that will add value to the team or to the governance team in, in the remaining year of this term? Well, actually, I think what you're, the real question then is, I think the question that it sounds like we actually want answered is, in your one year term, what would be your main goal? And that's a different question then. But it is a different question. So the goal, I don't I, I don't know that that's a candidate. I would secret. say because we really the goals are about the board goals mm -hmm. together. It's what value do you bring to that process? Is there a way to maybe state that a little bit? So what personal professional? I mean, I think it's fine to just leave it at 18 the way it is. So if you let if you let us words in the bed, not just around, we'll be words in the bed a little bit. So something to back up in your one plus year term that remains. What personal professional quality skills or strengths do you bring to the board that will add value to the government? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's fine. Okay. Everything else is okay then. Um, Can I get clarification oh. on question 12? We are leaving that question in. Yes. And we are removing assistance league from the checklist. We're going to confirm whether, We're going to confirm whether it's national charity league. Okay. Um, also want to um, let the board know that they need to be thinking about um, their single question that they're asking of each candidate. So obviously we've already got these answers. So don't use the same question but it needs to be one that is fairly, um, in terms of looking at depth or quality, it should be something like, not like, like how so, many, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be just a single word answer. It should be something that they could elaborate on because if there's a variety of questions from the four of us, that will give us a different look at the candidate. Um, and, and then, of course, um, do we want to um, share it or not share it? Like it's going to be a surprise or? Maybe we can add that to be part of the agenda on our screener. Since we're doing a really quick meeting, can we share out our interview question on that Monday? The only reason why I asked for it to be shared is because if Julie and I have the same question, right, you know, right, and then right. I come only prepared with that question. And of course, we could come with three or four, but it's not fair if we change it up. So we should actually, you know, have a quick submission of these are my questions and make sure. And so one of the things we can do is push out to the board in the WDM this week. Uh, examples of the actual interview questions because there's lots out there. CSBA mm -hmm. has, in fact, we'll push that out on the WDM. CSBA has a little packet, and some mm -hmm. of that is potential interview questions.
The other thing you may want to consider is the amount of time that you're going to provide each candidate uh, because that will factor into the questions that you're gonna be asking and how much time each person has. And then you really need to be consistent with that for each candidate. Yeah, I think we should have a timer. And I think that they too, for each question should what have two or three minutes. Yeah. It shouldn't be really more so than So let me ask you one other thing too. Um, there's a, sorry, this is a, something we use when we're interviewing uh, administrators, really in most districts do this as a forced choice piece. If you've ever done that before, would that be something the board would like us to provide you? So essentially it's a grid. And as you interview a candidate, it forces you to choose top candidate and then move the others down or not. Like a speech and debate tournament. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so we'll have that prepared for you as well. Okay. That'd be great. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And if there are no further discussions. Sorry, are and we there... sharing, when are we sharing the interview question then? Are we gonna share it on the- So I'm gonna push it out, or we'll push it out this Friday to you, unless you- we well, can do it I'm just later. wondering when we're all sharing it with each other. Oh. It's our when after we've done the screen. I think the screening. Well, so on the screening yeah. meeting. Okay. 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 So if there are no further discussion, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Good meeting. Thank you.